Once I was giving a Dharma talk in New York City, and as part of the introduction, the person introducing me mentioned that I was a New Yorker myself. I'd been born out on the eastern end of Long Island, growing up on a potato farm. And even though it was a farm, it was not that farm from the city. After the talk, a woman came up and mentioned that she and her family had had a vacation home in Kutchhog, which was just a few miles down the road from where I grew up. And she was amazed that a little potato farm boy from eastern end of Long Island would end up studying the Dharma in Thailand. At first I felt a little insulted. Don't farm boys have hearts? Can't they dream? Can't they aspire to something better than what they've got? But then I realized that this is a pattern throughout the history of Buddhism, people doing unexpected things, unpredictable things. A similar incident happened when I was in Thailand. Someone new to the monastery noticed a Western monk at the monastery, and so I asked a John Fuang, how is it that Westerners can ordain? And his response was, don't Westerners have hearts? Maybe he was sensitive to that issue because he himself had been looked down on many times. After all, he was a peasant boy, orphaned when he was very young. And looking at him from outside, you wouldn't expect anything much out of his life. But he was able to make himself something special. Not because he was trying to make himself into something special, but he wanted to find something special in life. This goes for almost all of the greater Johns, sons of peasants. Looking at them from the outside, you would have predicted either a life trying to struggle up the social ladder or being stuck at the bottom of the social ladder, or rebelling in predictable ways. As a John Fuang once told me, if it hadn't been for the Dhamma, he could have very easily ended up with a life of crime. Fortunately, he saw that there were, was the possibility of something better, and so he did the unpredictable thing. And of course, this is a tradition that goes back to the Buddha himself. The predictable thing for a young prince back in those days would have been to enjoy his life of pleasures, perhaps get involved in a war or two. But as you saw, that kind of life was simply looking for happiness and things that age, grow ill, and die. He himself was going to age, grow ill, and die. Isn't there something better? So he left home. And at first he did the predictable things. He went to study with other teachers. And then he started doing unpredictable things. And the teachers offered to have him teach as well. He realized this wasn't what he wanted. He wanted something better. So he tried something else that was predictable. People who have been indulging in pleasure for a long time, when they see the drawbacks of that kind of life, tend to go to the other extreme. So that's just what he did. Six years of self-torment, to the point where he realized he had tortured himself more than anybody else had ever done. But he saw that it was a blind alley. That's when he did something else unpredictable. He said, there must be another way. And he found it. So this may be one of the reasons why he was so dead set against determinism. When he found the true way, he was teaching it, he wasn't the kind of person who would go out and look for people to argue with, but there were a few cases where he did. And one of them was he went to some people who taught that everything you experience in the present moment is determined by the past, either by the actions of a creator deity or your own past karma. 
And he would argue with those people. If everything you experience right now is determined by the past, then if you're going to kill right now, steal right now, have illicit sex right now, that's all been determined by the past. You can't have any choice in the matter. And in that case, there is no should be done or shouldn't be done. People just do what they have to do. So you're leaving people unprotected, bewildered. In other words, you're just stuck in that original problem of suffering. You're bewildered by the pain. And because you have no way of dealing with it, you're unprotected. He saw the importance of the fact that there is an opportunity for freedom in the present moment. Not everything you're experiencing right now has been determined by the past. You can make a difference. You don't have to do the predictable thing. Like when you're sitting here right now, if things are going well, the predictable thing is to get carried away and complacent. But what if you were to do something unpredictable? Tell yourself, okay, now I've got something going good here. What's the best thing to do with it? Is this the time to maintain it? Or is this the time to use it for something else? If things are not going well, the predictable thing is that you're going to get upset and you can go to a down, downward spiral. But how about doing the unpredictable thing? Not getting upset. See what happens when you're with something, a state of mind in the present moment that's not good, but you're not upset by it. This doesn't mean you say, well, just accept it and be okay with it. That's another predictable thing. Ask yourself, what can I learn? What was the, would be the best thing to do with this state of mind? Because that's what allowed the Buddha to do those unpredictable things. He kept asking, what's the best thing to do? Because once he got rid into right concentration, he didn't just stay in concentration. He asked himself, is there knowledge that can be derived from this state of concentration? And the first question he asked himself, how about previous births? Have I been born before? And he saw that he had. You can see many, many aeons. Now the predictable thing then would have been to set himself up as a teacher with his knowledge of past lives. He said, no, what's the best thing to do with this knowledge? That was to t lead to another question. What causes the patterns and the ups and downs of previous lifetimes? That's when he had his second knowledge. He was seeing beings dying and being reborn in line with their karma, and seeing how complex karma was. There's a basic principle. You act on skillful intentions and you get good results, good rebirths. You act on unskillful intentions, you get bad results, bad rebirths. But it's not automatic that what you do in one lifetime will determine what's going to happen in the next lifetime, because you have other karmic influences coming in from the past, perhaps other lifetimes. And they can have an influence as well. But here again, he could have set himself up as a teacher, teaching, teaching people about karma and rebirth. But then he asked himself, what's the best use of this knowledge? And one of the things he had seen in the teachings on karma, or the way karma worked out, was that your state of mind at death could actually go against a lot of karma, karmic tendencies coming in from the past. In other words, if your state of mind at death was really good, it could compensate for a lot of bad things you've done. If your state of mind at death was bad, it could delay the good results of good karma, which meant that the state of your mind in the present moment doesn't have to be shaped by the past, and it can have an influence to counteract influences coming in from the past. 
And so the question is, what's the best use of that knowledge? Well, to see what you can do in the present moment to get out of this system entirely. That's a question that would have been totally unpredictable, aside from the fact that he really wanted freedom. This is the one thing you could say was predictable, once you knew him as a person, was that he would do everything for the sake of freedom. But people like that are hard to predict. Your sociologists look at classes of people and they say, well, this class of people will tend in this direction and that class of people will tend in that direction. But what they can't see is who among those people would really do everything for the sake of freedom. Even the Buddha himself couldn't say. There was that time when he was asked if the whole world was going to go to awakening or half the world or a third of the world. He refused to answer. The Brahmin who asked the question seemed to be upset, so Venerable then pulled him aside and gave him an analogy. Suppose there's a fortress, and there's an intelligent gatekeeper, and he wanders around the fortress, inspecting the wall. And aside from the one main gate into the fortress, he doesn't see a hole big enough even for a cat to slip through. So as a result, what does he know? He doesn't know how many people are going to come in and out of the fortress, but he does know that if they're going to come in and go out, they're going to come in and out through the gate. In the same way, the Buddha doesn't know how many people are going to choose to want to do the unpredictable thing and go for total freedom. But the ones who will go for total freedom will have to follow this path. The Ten Guidelines for Moral Action, the Four Establishings of Mindfulness, the Seven Factors for Awakening. So remember, we have this opportunity to be unpredictable. We live in a monastery where the, the routine is pretty standard, and the predictable things either are to simply follow in with the routine or to try to rebel against the routine. The unpredictable thing is to use this opportunity to find freedom, freedom from your defilements, because the defilements are giving you the worst routines. Meditation goes well, the defilements tell you to get excited, get complacent. The meditation doesn't go well, the defilements will tell you maybe it's better that you gave up, or they just get you depressed. So try to work free of the routines and the defilements. You know your predictable patterns, but you don't have to follow them. This is why when the Buddha, when he gave his shortest synopsis of the awakening, boiled it down to a pattern of causality, in which what happens in the present moment is shaped partly by the past, but also partly by independent decisions in the present moment itself. And those are free. And they don't have to be predictable. So take advantage of that. It's because of that principle that meditation can take you someplace that you wouldn't have predicted. Something unpredictably good.